This is the diamond that gives us the inspiration to turn our ideas into reality. It's the force behind whatever we manifest, and it's particularly strong in those who create, whether that's art, music, poetry, song, dance. And I also believe it's very active in those who make waves in any industry, really. Uh, it's active in great scientists, entrepreneurs, chefs, healers, coaches, and so on. Anywhere our imagination can be expressed on this physical material plane, that's a great place for the diamond muse. Hi, my name is Kat and you're watching Kat Rose Astrology. And today I'd like to share with you a talk on the four different types of personal diamond. And these are just the four that I've identified, but I'm doing this in the hope that you might be inspired to discover and get to know your personal diamond. Uh, maybe some of these types ring a bell. Uh, maybe there's another type that I haven't discovered yet myself, but I thought we could explore these four types today and see if they resonate with you. Um, before I get into that, uh, just to give you a little brief overview of what the personal diamond is. Well, I've got loads of videos uh, already on the diamond. Uh, I'll link to those below. Uh, there's a whole playlist on them. Um, as well as a book on the subject, Discovering Your Personal Diamond. Uh, I released this book last year and you can still pick that up on my website, catroseastrology.com. Uh, and I've also linked to a bunch of other books that I really, really recommend checking out if you're interested in the subject of the diamond. You can find all of those in the description to this video. But in order to kind of summarize, you can think of the diamond as a kind of spirit. Uh, some are more benevolent than others, but the one that I'm concerned with is the personal diamond. And this is the spirit that is the guiding spirit effectively assigned to each of us at birth, whose job it is to guide us and lead us towards our destiny. And it's possible that there are many more types of personal diamond than I'm going to outline today. But I think these four uh, archetypes are a really good starting place. And they're ones that I've come to see through talking to different clients about their diamonds, um, as well as just doing some research of this on my own. I say some, it's like I've got a book of research on this, but yeah, this is a, this is a work in progress and I'm always willing to learn more about the diamond. So let me know if you've got other types that you've identified. So the first type of personal diamond that I wanted to share with you is the diamond guru. So this kind of diamond is the kind that first and foremost wants to guide us. Uh, old diamonds serve as guides, but in this case, it really is a diamond who is wanting to impart wisdom to us or um, help us gain insight into ourselves, to our destiny, into the, to the workings of the world around us. Um, and like I said, most of all, identify that path that we're meant to be walking on. And I imagine diamond gurus kind of like the, the Gandalf kind of characters in the world, uh, stern, trustworthy, uh, but above all, full of wizardly knowledge that they can impart on us. Yoda is another good diamond guru figure, I'd say. And as an example of the diamond guru showing up in someone's real life, uh, we've got Carl Jung and his archetypal friend Philemon. So Jung describes this character of Philemon in his book, Memories, Dreams and Reflections, and how this, this figure appeared in his life. So in, in the book, Jung describes a dream in which he sees a sea blue sky with clods of brown earth um, kind of looking like clouds breaking apart and out of these the sky emerged a figure uh, an old man with kingfisher wings carrying a bunch of keys um, he also had the, the horns of a bull and Jung kind of didn't really know what to make of it but he painted the image and you know kind of held that as he went about his day-to-day his -day life I suppose but it was during a quite intense period in Jung's life. And during that time, he was struck by the synchronicity of finding a dead kingfisher, um, which is a bird that you'd rarely find in his hometown um, around Zurich. And from then on, Philemon, who was the figure that he identified in the dream, this, this old man, um, regularly appeared in Jung's dreams and, and sort of waking, waking dreams as well. And, you know, after, I guess, getting to know this figure more, Jung concluded that Philemon represented a kind of wisdom that was beyond Jung's own knowledge and, and understanding. He wrote, Philemon represented a force which was not myself. In my fantasies, I held conversations with him, and he said things which I had not consciously thought. Psychologically, Philemon represented a superior insight. He was a mysterious figure to me. At times, he seemed to me quite real, as if he were a living personality. And to me, he was what Indians call a guru. So they have a kind of um, figure that shows up in our life and it imparts wisdom or gets us to kind of think about things uh, that we might not have uh, discovered on our, our, on our own. Now, I'd also like to share with you the planets that 
this out of the seven traditional planets that align most closely with each of these four archetypes. Uh, so there are seven planets that I want to assign to these four. So some will have two, some will have one. But these are the planets that I think archetypally match closest with these, these four types of diamond. And the reason I'm doing this partly is because this is a, an astrology channel, but also because it's super useful when you're using this technique, um, which I outline in my book uh, in terms of the astrology technique techniques to discover your personal diamond. Um, and this technique is where you look for the strongest or um, most dominant planet in your birth chart uh, as a kind of representative, a planetary analog of your personal diamond. Um, and this comes from Porphyry. And there are different ways of, you know, figuring this planet out, but, uh, and you, you'll get different results. But the one that I outline in the book, I, I really stand by. And, you know, the question that I get in clients when we, when we talk about this, this technique and we talk about the planet that we get to, that we land at, um, what do you do with that then? How do you understand that planet in relation to your daimon? And I'm hoping that talking about these four archetypes might help us kind of imagine what form our daimon comes in, what personality it has. And I think associating them with these different planets um, makes things a lot easier when you're trying to interpret this in, in your chart and in your life. So the daimon guru type is most closely aligned with both Jupiter and the sun. So if Jupiter or the sun are the strongest planets in your chart, um, you might find that the, the daimon guru really speaks to you. And I say this because Jupiter and the sun are both planets that speak to wisdom and insight just in kind of different ways. So Jupiter very much speaks to the drive towards gaining knowledge, gaining insight, exploring the world around us in order to understand it and our place in it, as well as what we judge as right and wrong. It's kind of like our moral compass in that way. The sun is much more like the consciousness that we bring to something, where we're being pulled energetically, uh, where our focus is being directed, and where we get inspiration. And I imagine that if Jupiter is the planet that represents your daimon, I imagine that the guru quality will show up in where you're drawn to explore, to gain knowledge. What, what are you drawn to learning? As well as the kinds of teachers that you are drawn towards and that show up in your life. If the sun represents your diamond, the guru quality will show up in that spark of excitement. Uh, you feel that when you come across something inspiring, captivating, uh, the feeling of all you get when you're in flow um, or working on something that you find meaningful. And of course, these planets are also going to be able to represent other types of diamond. But I think in particular, the diamond guru is, is really closely aligned with those. And I really think that having a personal Daimon guru figure is immensely valuable, uh, you know, and if you can get to know it, it will never steer you wrong in terms of where you should be focusing if you are interested in living a meaningful, purposeful life. So next up, we've got the Daimon Muse. This is the second type of personal Daimon that I've identified. And the Daimon Muse is likely a Daimon archetype that will speak to the creatives out there. This is the Daimon that gives us the inspiration to turn our ideas into reality. It's the force behind whatever we manifest, and it's particularly strong in those who create, whether that's art, music, poetry, song, dance. And I also believe it's very active in those who make waves in any industry, really. Uh, it's active in great scientists, entrepreneurs, chefs, healers, coaches, and so on. Anywhere our imagination can be expressed on this physical material plane, um, that's a great place for the Diamond Muse. And here's a really lovely quote from Stephen P uh, Pressfield, who wrote the book, The War of Art, which I really think embodies the Diamond Muse, as he likens this kind of archetype to angels, which, you know, angels, diamonds, it, it can be interchangeable. He says, angels work for God. It's their job to help us, wake us up, bump us along. Angels are agents of evolution. The Kabbalah describes angels as bundles of light, meaning, intelligence consciousness. Kabbalists believe that above every blade of grass is an angel crying, grow, grow. Angels are like muses. They know stuff we don't. They want to help us. They're on the other side of a pane of glass shouting to get our attention, but we can't hear them. We're too distracted by our own nonsense. Ah, but when we begin, when we make a start, when we conceive an enterprise and commit to it in the face of our fears, something wonderful happens. Angel midwives congregate around us. They assist as we give birth to ourselves, to that person we were born to be, to the one whose destiny was encoded in our soul, our diamond, our genius. 
I think that's a really powerful passage uh, that really encapsulates the quality of the personal Daimon muse as a source of inspiration and of encouragement, of a motivational kind of force that assists our creativity. So what would this look like? How would the Daimon muse show up in our lives? I've got another quote here, this time from Elizabeth Gilbert, who reports a conversation that she had with the American poet Ruth Stone about how she wrote, writes her poetry. Gilbert says that when the poet Ruth Stone was growing up in rural Virginia, she would be out working in fields and she said that she would feel a poem coming at her from over the landscape. She said that when she felt it coming, because the earth uh, would shake under her feet, she knew that she had only one thing to do at that point, and that was, in her words, run like hell. And she would run like hell to the house, being chased by this poem. And the whole deal was that she had to get to a piece of paper and pencil fast enough so that when it thundered down through her, she could collect it and grab it on the page. So I think a lot of us will be able to relate to this, that kind of feeling of urgency that comes when uh, an idea, a thought, an image, a sound, song, like hits us out of the blue. Um, these ideas come to us. They don't come from us. They come to us. And it's just our job to make sure it doesn't, we have to catch it before it flies away. Um, and put it down on the page or, you know, record it in some way before it goes. So the planets that I've identified the most likely to be expressed through the Daimon Muse are Venus and the Moon. So I say Venus naturally uh, because Venus is a planet associated with the arts, with creativity, with beauty, and in many ways symbolizes what we most value in the physical world. Of course, she's also the goddess of love and in some ways can symbolize the object of our passions, uh, what we're captivated by, what draws us, what draws us in. The Daimon Muse can show up in this way and this is where diamonds can also be represented in key people in our lives. Take the artist who literally has a muse, uh, a beautiful woman maybe who inspires them to paint amazing portraits. That's a, like kind of the classic image. You've got um, people like Dante Rossetti, um, who painted the dressmaker Alexa Wilding. I'll show a picture of that. Interestingly, uh, this Alexa Wilding sat for more of his finished works than any other model, but comparatively little is known about her due to the lack of any romantic connection with her and Rossetti. They shared a lasting bond. And after Rossetti's death, Wilding was said to have traveled regularly to place a wreath on his grave. And another more modern example is David Lynch, who has this famous muse, Krista Bell who appeared in The Return of Twin Peaks, as well as Lynch's film uh, Inland Empire. They've also recorded a studio album together. And again, not a romantic connection as far as I know. Um, they've just got this very aligned artistic sensibility and a shared interest in mysticism and spirituality. Bell says of Lynch, we'd have these great conversations. We have similar intrigues, esoteric, in uh, esoteric subjects, the great unknown. Um, and I also love the story of Dante and Beatrice. Uh, Beatrice is thought to be the principal inspiration for Dante's uh, Vita Nova and is commonly identified with the Beatrice who appears as one of the guides in the Divine Comedy, like how more Daimon Muse do you want to get? So maybe you too have had encounters with individuals who've, you know, and not just romantic partners, but people, friends, uh, teachers who've brought out the most creative side of you who've encouraged you, sparked your best ideas, who called you on to bring about whatever seed was planted in your soul. Again, your personal diamond can be represented by almost anyone. Um, it can be channeled through people in our life, as well as having its own reality in, in our dreams and fantasies. The moon, like I said, is also a possible planetary candidate for a diamond muse. And I say this because the moon is kind of like the muse of the sun. You know, the sun brings out the beauty of the moon um, and, and gives, gives her form, really. Um, the energy, it shines on her, kind of like how these artists bring out the beauty of the muse through their, through their attention. They kind of transform or um, commit the, the muse to reality. The moon also represents the physical world and what we bring into life. Um, it represents you know, motherhood, what we birth. And if the Daimon Muse speaks to this aspect of human life, this procreative quality, I'd say that the moon is a wonderful embodiment of this generative process, the creativity of humans. All right, next up, we've got the Daimon Trickster. So 
this is an interesting one. Um, and uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of idea what I mean by a trickster, in mythology and folklore, a trickster is a character in a story who exhibits a great deal of intellect um, or secret knowledge that it uses to play tricks and disobey normal rules or defy conventional behavior. Lewis Hyde, in his book, Trickster Makes the, This World, describes the trickster as a boundary crosser. The trickster crosses over and often breaks both physical and societal rules. He says that tricksters violate principles of social and natural order, playfully disrupting normal life and then re-establishing it on a new basis. And note that kind of idea of a boundary crosser and guess what planet is going to be related to this? Mercury, Hermes. And Hermes, as we know, the myth follows that Hermes got up to all kinds of stuff um, as a as a young as a young god. Um, there's the story of Hermes stealing cattle from his brother Apollo, and through tricks like making the cows walk backwards, um, hiding his tracks, um, he's confusing the meaning of the signs that he leaves behind. Ultimately, this is pointing to a lot of kind of trickster myths. They're often kind of confusing and, and bizarre. Um, but the way I understand that is their meaning, their messages are all down to each of us to interpret. There's no one grand Jupiterian um, point that any of them are trying to make. Um, they're, they're all very personal, very mercurial in that way. So, um, and just like that, the kind of tricks that the, the daimon trickster can play on us, um, they're all going to be very individual down to us to interpret, um, not the clearest of signs. They might be more um, abstract and like frustrating and bizarre. Um, but clearly in, in the myth of Hermes, the trickster thief god, Hermes is, is representing a disruptive energy. He gets the other gods to pay attention to something that they may have been overlooking, uh, taking for granted, um, ignoring or even repressing. And I believe that that's also what the trickster diamond does for us, brings our attention, focuses us in on something that um, we have not been looking at. I have a trickster diamond. Uh, I tell the story in my book about this diamond, but basically the, my book, Discovering Your Personal Diamond, um, was very close to not existing. In Back in April, 2020, when I built up quite an impressive amount of research, um, all stored on my laptop, nothing was like physical. I managed to delete all of my work when I was switching laptops and it was a real bummer, as you can imagine. And at that moment in April, I it kind of woke me up. It made me realize you know, I need to stop sitting on this research and actually do something with it. I need to commit to this book if I actually want to write it uh, and, you know, start doing something with, with this research. And, and that was the decision I made. I, I decided to rebuild as much of the research that I could, do new research and just basically focus on writing the book rather than just hoarding a lot of ideas. And I feel like my personal diamond was in some ways guiding that sequence of events, if not causing it, you know, in a very trickster-like way. Um, getting me to to wake up, to pay attention, to make a choice and to, you know, write the damn book. So what happens when we try to ignore the personal diamond, especially the trickster diamond? How does it try to get our attention? And here's a quote from James Hillman from the book, The Soul's Code, who says, the diamond motivates, it protects, it invents and persists with stubborn fidelity. It resists compromising reasonableness and often forces deviance and oddity upon its keeper, especially when neglected or opposed. It offers comfort and can pull you into its shell, but it cannot abide innocence. It can make the body ill. It is out of step with time, finding all sorts of faults, gaps, and knots in the flow of life, and it prefers them. So this quote makes you consider that the diamond isn't just this sweet, helpful little care bear guiding our path lined with unicorns and buttercups. It also has a trickster-like side, one that can be quite annoying at best and devastating at worst. So whenever we want to take the easy path, whenever there, we feel like, yeah, I can just get away with doing that or ignoring this, there's a good chance that there is a diamond there saying, oh, no, you don't. I found something that's much more interesting. And if you choose to ignore my call, I can make life very difficult for you. I can cause a lot of chaos in your life in order to get you to pay attention. So who are my planetary candidates for the trickster diamond? You've probably already guessed that Mercury is one of them and Mars is the other. So like I said, of course it would be Mercury. Um, Mercury is the ultimate archetypal trickster god. 
also seen in uh, if you want to look in other mythologies you've got loki you've got krishna and others and naturally mars is also a really great candidate mars is a planet that represents the disruption of peace it severs what we don't need especially if we're very attached to something it can make us very uncomfortable and it thrives on discomfort it calls us to be more than we currently are and if we can rise to the challenge that mars sets us the reward is Mars will bless our battle scars. It will send us on our way stronger and braver than we were before. So it's not all bad having a trickster diamond. So the final personal diamond type that I've identified is, and I'm kind of looking for a different name for this, but at the moment it's called the diamond party pooper. This is going to go back to the probably the first personal diamond that was ever recorded at least. Um, which is the daimon or daimonion of Socrates. So with the great philosopher Socrates, the general daimon that was kind of in vogue, I guess, at the time or written about before that, the, these, this kind of idea of the daimon as a, an impersonal force, um, the daimons that occupy places and you know, temples, but not necessarily individuals, um, that all changes. And with Socrates, you get this idea of the personal guide personally assigned to each individual with the job of steering us on our path to destiny. And, and that's what all of these, these diamond types do, by the way. But the party pooper in particular, um, I think is the most closely aligned with, with Socrates' famous diamond. So Socrates was recorded as somebody who regularly made decisions based on the injunctions of his daimonion or daimon. Uh, daimonion is just like the, the neutral term for the word daimon. It was effectively thought of as a voice or an inner guide, or even like a kind of sense of conscience that nudged Socrates away from certain things. Socrates himself said, the favor of the gods has given me a marvelous gift, which has never left me since childhood. It is a voice which, when it makes itself heard, deters me from what I am about to do and never urges me on, which again, sounds like not very much fun, but... Um, it's also, I think, responsible for why Socrates didn't conform with what society wanted of him and, and why we're still talking about um, Socrates and his teachings today. It's also worth noting that Socrates' personal happiness or safety wasn't important to this daimon. One of the most well-recorded moments of Socrates' daimon is that it made no sign of opposition during the trial which would condemn Socrates to death. Socrates took this to mean, this, this silence, to mean that death was not an evil to be feared, but was instead the next journey of existence. In his own words, Socrates addressed the court by saying, Up until this point, the divine faculty of which the internal oracle is the source has constantly been in the habit of opposing me, even about trifles. And now, as you can see, there has come upon me which may be thought, and is generally believed to be, the last and worst evil. But the oracle made no sign of opposition, either when I was leaving my house in the morning, or when I was on my way to the court, or while I was speaking, at anything which I was going to say, and yet I have often been stopped in the middle of my speech. But now in nothing I either said or did, touching the matter in hand, has the oracle opposed me. What do I take to be the explanation of this silence? I will tell you. It is an intimation that what has happened to me is a good and that those of us who think that death, death is an evil are in error. For the customary sign would surely have been, would have opposed me had I been going to evil and not to good. And henceforth, Socrates had so much trust in his daimon that he went obligingly to his death. So naturally, the last planet on our list and the one that must, of course, be assigned to the party pooper daimon type has to be Saturn. Saturn is the ultimate naysayer the voice of reason and never the voice of fun and frivolity. Saturn deters us, steers us away, but does not encourage us or call us forth. That said, if you can stomach Saturn and pay attention to the signs that it gives us, you can walk the most meaningful, fulfilling path towards your destiny. Socrates is a wonderful example of this. You know, who's strong enough to willingly walk into their death? Uh, knowing that it's the right thing to do, uh, but also knowing that they have a choice in the matter, that they could run away from it. What bravery, what peace of mind, what confidence, what grace, what composure must be required in order to do that, um, or anything hard for that matter. And that's what the Daimon party pooper grants us, so long as we pay attention to it and develop our relationship with it. 
So there you have it. That's the four types of personal daimon, as well as the seven planetary gods that can be assigned to each of those. If you'd like to work out what planet in your birth chart is the one that is most closely aligned with your type of daimon and then figure out what the type is from, from this, um, you can do that. But there are different methods for it. The one that I personally recommend to people is the one that Porphyry like, uh, lays out in book four of his introduction to Ptolemy's Tetrabiblios. And if you can't get your hands on that translation or anything, um, I also lay it out in my book, Discovering Your Personal Daimon. And if you want somebody just to do it for you, I also offer daimon readings. And this is one of the four techniques that we look at. Uh, so you can find out more about that and my book at catroseastrology.com. And it's possible that, you know, your personal daimon is a mixture of these types, or maybe there's a type of daimon that, you know, I haven't identified. I'd be really interested in what you think. Just leave me a comment below. As always, if you've been enjoying these videos, if you'd like to support this channel in any way, you can do that. You can click like, you can subscribe to this channel and turn on the notifications to know when I'm releasing new videos. And as always, just keep watching. That really, really helps and is greatly appreciated by me. All right, I hope that was helpful. Take care and I'll catch you next time. Bye.